مساء الخير يا جماعة مساء الخير يا مصطفى شكرا جدا 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 انك النهاردة معنا مصطفى يا جماعة هو فول ستاك وماشين ليرنينج انجينير واشتغل مع فاست جروينج ستارت ابس از تكنيكال كونسلتنت وكمان شارك في الاكوزيشن بتاع تو ستارت ابس اذر باي ديزايننج يعني سكيلبل سوفت وير اركيتكتشرز وهو ديزاين اند امبلمنتد ماشين ليرنينج كومبوننتس ذات ار ديبلويد ان برودكشن اند ار بينج يوزد باي دوزنز اوف يوزرز افري داي مصطفى كمان عمل تو موكس اون ذا توبيك اوف ماشين ليرنينج وديب ليرنينج النهارده مصطفى قمر الدين هيكلمنا عن deep learning methods that can be utilized to fight the pandemic. طيب مصطفى شكرا جدا وانا متاكده ان السيشن دي هتبقى سوبر يوسفل بالنسبه لكل الهاكاثون بارتيسيبنتس ان شاء الله فممكن تحب ان انت تنطلق بقى و... شكرا ليكي صابرين على المقدمه الجميله دي احنا ممكن نبدا نتكلم في الموضوع احنا عندنا سلايد السلايد دي هي جزء من ريسيرش شغل انا عملته في الاي اي انستيتيوت وده انستيتيوت افيليتد مع ام اي تي لوكيتد في بوسطن في ماساتشوستس وهنتكلم في اوفر فيو بشكل هاي ليفل عن الديب ليرنينج ميثودز اللي ممكن نستخدمها في ابلكيشنز في البانديميك بتاعت الكورونا فايروس او النوفل كورونا فايروس فاحنا مش هدخل في تفاصيل كتيره عن الديتيلز التكنيكال ديتيلز بتاعت كل ميثود بس هديك فكره سريعه كل ميثود بتستخدم في ايه او ازاي وايه اهم مميزاتها وبعد كده هندخل في التطبيقات والتطبيقات دي هنتكلم فيها عن النوفل اركتكتشر الابداع في التصميم وازاي هي بتاخد فكره بسيطه وبعكس ما الناس كلها فاكره الديب ليرنينج هو حاجه صعبه ومعقده هو بالتاكيد فيها طبعا انجينيرنج وساينس لكن هي في الاول هي ارت يعني هي فيها فن اكتر ما كان فيها تعقيدات هندسيه ودي الحاجه اللي دايما باكد عليها انك اي معلومه في اي مجال تبقى متاكد ان الساينتست اللي جاب الفكره دي هو فكر فيها بشكل انتويتيف uh, بمعنى ان هو فكر بشكل تفكير منطقي عقلاني مش تفكير ان هو بيعمل uh, uh, افكار معقده وبعد كده يقول uh, دي فكره اكثر تعقيدا لا هي تفكير بسيط جدا تعالوا نشوف مع بعض uh, نتكلم الاول دي الاجنده بتاعتنا النهارده هنتكلم عن الديب ليرنينج الميثودز اللي هنحتاجها هنتكلم عن ثلاثه ابلكيشنز افتكر دول من خلال الريسيرش اللي انا عملته أكتر ثلاثة أبلكيشنز ممكن نحتاجهم في آه الهاكاثون وبشكل عام في مكافحة الفيروس الكورونا آه أول أبلكيشن إزاي نقدر نعزز فكرة السوشيال ديستانسينج أو التباعد الاجتماعي ما بين الناس وبعضها وإزاي نعمل آه تدابير وقائية وتدخلات سريعة لما آه يبقى عندنا بيانات بتقول إن في آه حاجة غير كده وبعد كده بنتكلم عن التشخيص الطبي نفسه ازاي ان انا اقدر اشخص حاله من خلال الايمج وفي في الاخر نبذه بسيطه عن تحليل الدم برضو البلاد سامبلز بعد كده بنتكلم بقى عن اهم موضوع اللي هو اكتشاف المضاد او المصل او اللقاح للفيروس وازاي الديب ليرنينج يقدر يساعد في حاجه زي كده طبعا انا الباك جراوند بتاعتي هي في الـ في الانجينيرنج سايد مش في البايو انفورماتكس فهبقى طبعا المعلومات بتاعتي الى حد ما مش متعمقه جدا في البايو انفورماتكس لكن هقدر افيدكم في حته الانجينيرنج او الماشين ليرنينج والديب ليرنينج زي ما هنبدا نشوف مع بعض الافكار خلينا نبدا الاول بالديب ليرنينج ونشوف ايه الافكار اللي ممكن نحتاجها انا شايف في اسئله في حد بيطلب ان احنا نعملها بال الانجليش صابرين مش متاكد هل دي طلب كلنا نعمل انجليش انا يعني ما عنديش مشكله خالص بس عشان هو طلب واحد لو صابرين بس موجود ايوه ايوه معاكم طبعا معاكم معلش كنت عامله ميوت طب جماعه جايز داز اني ون هاف اني بروبلم اف وي ديد ذس ان انجليش سم ون از اسكينج اف وي كان دو ات ان انجليش Uh, what do you prefer? Can you just uh, send it to mm. Just up, upvote uh, if you'd like 
to have it in English or Halina uh, um, so far to upvoted the English. Okay. طب does anyone have a problem او حد عنده مشاكل لو عملناها بالانجلش مش هيفهم الانجلش ممكن يكومنت او يبعت لي برايفتلي او حاجه على الكي ان اي طيب <تصفيق> Final, final uh, call. <laughs> uh, whoever wants to do it in English, I guess. Mustafa, into 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 comfortable with E. I'm not having any problem. I'm not sure I've done it before in the AI Institute in English. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So let's continue in English then. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So far, we have not been uh, diving deeper into the topic yet. So we had an agenda with three applications and some basics. So we'll cover now the basics, the modules that we'll be uh, putting together as Jigsaw Puzzle so that we can build the application. Let's start with the deep learning methods and we will have an intuitive understanding of four topics, the generative adversarial networks, GANs, and the deep reinforcement learning, and graphic convolution networks and transformers. These are some of the topics that are underexplored in the literature of the deep learning research and study in most academics, but they are very powerful, uh, even though they are not the most common, but you have, you have seen them in applications. Uh, some applications are not uh, completely moral, such as deep fakes, but they have also been used in uh, some applications that uh, have made a lot of uh, impact in the recent years, such as reinforcement learning with DeepMind. And DeepMind, they have uh, uh, used the deep reinforcement learning to uh, beat the AlphaGo champion, the AlphaGo champion, uh, which is a game, a board game. And that uh, system was designed using deep reinforcement learning. The novel thing about the review today is that we are going to see how these applications can be used and not only in entertainment and toy applications, but also in medical and scientific industrial applications. Let's get started with generative adversarial networks. The model itself is two networks. The first network is the generator and it is fed with random noise. And the random noise is a, a probability distribution, either Gaussian distribution, normal distribution or uniform distribution. And then the idea is that the generator will approximate the distance between two probability distributions, the probability distribution of the noise, which is known, and the probability distribution of the training data. And this way we can say that the generator is uh, minimizing an F divergence or a distance metric between two probability distributions. In this case, it can output uh, generated images, videos, audio. It can even output text, even though text is a discrete space unlike images, which is continuous space. The interesting role here is played by the discriminator. The discriminator itself is kind of a policeman, an officer inspector, checking every output from the generator, comparing it with its own features extractors to find whether it is real or fake. So the Nash equilibrium will be arrived when the discriminator can no longer discriminate which images are real or uh, which images are fake or uh, generated by the generator. And at this point, we say this is a zero sum uh, equilibria, Nash equilibria, because everything output by the generator will be classified as real. The applications, as you have seen in deep fakes, having uh, some videos of um, uh, Barack Obama speaking and then changing the voice to somebody else. And then very, very recent, recently deep fakes was uh, very uh, uh, played a major part in the American uh, democracy when uh, Nancy Pelosi was uh, had a deep fake uh, made of it, and then that caused a lot of fuss in the diplomatic scene uh, in the United States. And then they can be also used in e-commerce applications because you can try the fashion uh, in augmented reality style, and then you can try different outfits 
because the generator will generate your image uh, conditioned on your uh, body pose and the fashion you are trying to uh, experiment. So what we are interested in today is the medical applications. So once you've got the idea of the model itself, we'll see how that can be utilized in medical applications. The other idea is uh, kind of intuitive. Uh, we're having a simulator, uh, the environment, and the environment here, we're not trying to model the environment. That would be very difficult because the environment is a, a very complex combination of multiple factors, the news, the stock market, uh, the weather, a, a lot of factors are playing into the environment. So we are only taking observations from the environment and then feeding them into the model. The model here will output either a value function or a policy gradient. So there are two variations of reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement learning. The first one is trying to uh, approximate the value of every action given the state of the environment. So for example, if you are reading the environment in this case, it could be the image from an Atari game. It could be the stock price from stock market uh, analytics. It, it could be any other environment you're interested in. And then you feed it through a neural network. And finally, you get a probability distribution of different value functions given these state action pairs. So that's the first variation, the value function. The second variation is the policy gradient in which you are not getting a value function output, you are getting an action approximation output. For example, you are given what action should I take uh, given the input state? So th this is desirable, and uh, even though at a very high level of understanding, it, it, it can seem to be very similar to each other. But in this case, the policy gradient is desirable in self-driving applications, autonomous driving, drones, robotics, because that allow us to take actions over continuous action space. Meaning, for example, when you're driving your own vehicle, it can go from zero to 300 miles per hour, and then you can take any value in between. It can be 256.4. But in the first variation, which is the Q learning or the value function, it's only taking discrete uh, action space, meaning it's either go forward or uh, go backward, steer left or steer right. So you can see here the different between two uh, paradigms will give you different applications. Uh, to your interest, it was uh, found that the model that was trained by DeepMind and beaten the world AlphaGo champion is actually a hybrid, a combination of the two models. So there is no one right way or there's no always a right answer, but a combination of intuitive jigsaw puzzles that you put together and experiment the results. So it's a more like uh, uh, we say this is a, a intuitive understanding of deep learning rather than scientific approach. So th this has been uh, in uh, applications in uh, robotics, self-driving cars, uh, but we'll see how this can be utilized also in medical applications because that will also give us a reward function. The reward function is that we are trying to maximize over time. The reward function in this case will be the desired chemical properties of the drugs we are designing. So we'll see how that uh, comes in the very last slides. The third variation we're talking about here is graph convolution networks. You, you might have heard of uh, convolution, convolution neural networks, which has been used uh, with images for feature extraction. You have might also heard of uh, recurrent neural networks, which are used for sequence data, such as text, uh, time series, any sequence data. But then there is a, a variation of data that has been uh, very fashionable because of the abundance of uh, social media. Uh, every user on social media is represented using a graph network or a graph database. So the person is a node and then we have edges. These edges represent the relations between the person and his friends on the social network. And also knowledge bases, they are kind of graph, uh, graph networks and knowledge bases were the ancestors, the early ancestors of artificial intelligence because we, uh, in the very first applications of artificial intelligence, 
we didn't use uh, neural networks or convolution networks. We used uh, knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs are kind of uh, decision trees or uh, di directed acyclic graphs designed by domain experts. For example, a domain expert in nuclear physics or in uh, medical applications will design a set of rules and these rules, they will lead to conclusions whether to take a decision A or decision B. So these were the very first motivations for graph convolution networks to extract features from graph uh, database. But then because the chemical compounds, they are also uh, 3D structures where the atoms are represented by nodes and the connections, the bonds between the atoms are represented by edges. So they are also a very good candidate, an ideal candidate for uh, graph convolution networks to uh, be used on them to extract the features. So you can see here that uh, every application that's uh, scientific or industrial can be an equivalence of another toy application or an entertainment application. So once you learn or master the techniques, the basics, then you can switch from one application to the other except that for some cases, in, uh, especially in drug design, you'll need a little bit of background in uh, molecular biology, uh, chemical, uh, computational chemistry, and so on. The fourth uh, variation here we're talking about is uh, word to vec or uh, word embeddings. Word embeddings, they are very popular in natural language processing and natural language understanding. And they are kind of using uh, neural networks these neural networks, they are again uh, doing a representation learning over discrete space of uh, vocabulary. This way we can input a sequence and extract some features with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, recurrent neural networks, but that was in the very first variations uh, up to the 2015 maybe. But then in 2017, exactly a paper was published attention is all you need. And then it uh, kind of uh, made recurrent neural networks out of fashion and uh, attention or self-attention and transformers became the state of the art, the most fashionable trend in uh, natural language processing because it's uh, computationally efficient. And also it's a, a variation of unsupervised learning using autoencoders when you have the sequence modeling uh, represented by attention, which is Attention is kind of weights. So when I say self-attention, I mean actually weights. We are, giving, we are giving different weights, priorities to the words in the sequence. For example, when I say, uh, I eat the fish, uh, here the two major words are eat and fish. That means the verb was uh, uh, applied to the uh, uh, object, object here, the fish. So that will give higher weights to to, to these two words of the vocabulary. So that, that was a, a new trend in natural language processing, which is became known as zero shot uh, unsupervised learning or zero shot learning, because uh, in, in this variation, we can apply the knowledge from one domain to another without having to re retrain the model on that other domain. So uh, again, because this is a, a model that's used in natural language processing, we can uh, adapt it to drug discovery by applying instead of the autoencoder on the language se sequence or the vocabulary, we are applying the graph embedding or the graph convolution to extract features from 3D molecular designs and then feed them through a network that will give different weights or different embeddings or different representation or more compact representation, this representation is desirable because it's a sparse, meaning that it highlights and emphasize the important features that discriminate the different categories in, in the play here. So you can see here the, 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 the puzzles, the pieces of the puzzle, they are very intuitive, and then they are put together in different uh, novel the architectures to give different functions. So this concludes the basic ideas that we need for the sake of this discussion. Of course, we cannot cover all of the methods in deep learning. I'm sorry, it's uh, my kids. They are having some hard time. So, uh, we... Okay, it's uh, quiet now. My apologies. 
So let's move now to the applications. We'll start with the social distancing and how we can track social distancing in an efficient way using these techniques. So there are a, a bit of ideas that we can cover in this uh, area. The first one, as you can see on the right uh, side of the slide, we are having face detection. But the interesting thing, face detection and recognition here is not applied on normal faces, but masked faces. So th this is not a very novel idea in deep learning literature because we used to have adversarial examples and adversarial studies on uh, face recognition, how to make face recognition robust when the face is not completely visible in the scene, when part of the face is hidden or occluded. So that's uh, called face recognition with occlusion. But this is a, actually a real startup in Hong Kong that uh, have managed to apply face recognition on masked faces with a high level of certainty or accuracy so that they can track the violators of the social distancing or the lockdown uh, restrictions. So th this is kind of a nifty application. And then it was given to the government on a contract. One of the ideas that you can apply in this hackathon, by the way. So you can see that the ideas here are becoming to come together and we can relate them to the hackathon uh, theme of COVID-19, uh, 1 million Arab coders. The second idea is the epidemiology model or the viral uh, propagation model. And here we are not talking about the pharmacological inter intervention. We are talking about the non-pharmacological intervention, meaning things that we can do in order to prevent the propagation of the virus without actually using any uh, drugs or vaccines as uh, things that can be enforced by a policy or a politics or any decision maker. Uh, the second idea is how we can uh, track social distancing on pedestrian data sets on the streets. And finally, how we can do that with high level 3D sensors. So let's, let's start with the first variation. Now it gets a little bit into the weeds with a little bit more technical slide here. So th this is based on the SER uh, model. The SER model is partial differential equations model which is very simply the rate of a change of some variables with respect to time, because that's actually what calculus or derivative is. What are the variables we are interested in? We are interested in the number of infected people, the susceptible people, the exposed people, and the recovered people. So the idea is very simple and intuitive. If you can uh, prevent the uh, infected people from uh, transferring the disease to the other exposed or susceptible people, then you can control the uh, propagation of the virus and you can flatten the curve, which is a term that has been in, uh, in the news so often now. So you can know now where the term is coming from. So SER model uh, is a partial differential equation based model, means it is based on rigorous mathematics. But in this variation, whenever there is a model based on rigorous mathematics, it's uh, susceptible itself to the factors that it's not taken into consideration. For example, the news, the weather, the time series uh, relation of the data with respect to each other. So deep learning comes to play here. We expand the model with more data from Google cell mobility data. It's data about tracking uh, kind of GPS tracking of the mo mo movement uh, of uh, different uh, the people. And then putting that together with other factors from the environment the weather, and then putting that with the time series data of the number of cases, the recovered cases, uh, the population density, etc., feeding it into the model. And then what we get at the end, we get a forecast. The forecast will forecast uh, predict the number of cases and the, num the number of recovered cases. So it is exactly what the SEER model does in the epidemiology design, but with more of deep learning flavor. The innovation of this paper, CERNET, which is a preprint on the archives, is that it is designed its own SEER cell. SEER cell here is inspired by the recurrent neural networks. So if you have done any readings in that area, you will find that recurrent neural networks, uh, some of their variations like long short term memory cells or LSTM in short, they are based on logical operations, kind of uh, uh, on and off switches inspired from logical design. And this uh, has been applied to the four variables in play in the equation in order to give kind of the same intuitive understanding of the uh, uh, 
interdependence between the time points in the time series. So it has been applied in two flavors, one with linear cells. Linear means uh, very simply a neural network. And the other variation is an LSTM cell, which is based on the long short term memory cell. You can try it with the GRU cell or other variation if you'd like. The model itself is available on GitHub and uh, the data set from Google Cell Mobility is available in the reference of the original paper. The second idea here is object tracking. So uh, let's first make a distinction. What's the difference between object tracking and object uh, detection? So object detection, when you're trying to detect a person in the image, but using a single frame. So an object tracking, we're more concerned with video inputs, with a sequence of frames. And more specifically, we are concerned with systems that can be deployed to embedded systems because surveillance, uh, surveillance systems, uh, camera systems, they are built on not so powerful uh, computer systems such as the ones in the cloud. So it's more near, we call it the edge of the network. Uh, and then you need to optimize for that. Uh, one of the variations you can see on the uh, right uh, bottom side of the slide is an architecture of the GoTurn model. And uh, you can see it's a kind of uh, simple design. You feed the previous frames of the video, but you feed also the current frame. And then you apply convolution filters to extract the features. And then you combine that through a neural network and that will give you the predicted location of the object of interest in the, new, in the current frame. So how can this be applied in COVID-19? So you can apply that. And instead of applying it for object tracking directly, you apply a post-processing filter that after you track, for example, the people in the scene as in the top right uh, uh, image of the slide, you can also approximate the distance between these people. So for example, if you find two people within one meter from each other, then you fire an alarm, send a push notification to their mobile system or uh, give them a warning uh, call the inspector or the police inspector to uh, ask them to uh, maintain a distance of at least two meters from each other and so on. And this has been applied in uh, South Korea, uh, by the way. There are many variations. If you'd like to try, there is the Oxford pedestrian data set that has this kind of training data labeled for you to play around with. And you can come up with something uh, very quickly in this hackathon. The third idea in that theme or in this uh, kind of social tracking applications is uh, the LiDAR technology. The LiDAR technology itself is based on sensors that send light signals and these light signals will hit the obstacles on its way and then reflect back to the, the, the sender or the, the transceiver part of the sensor that will calculate the time of travel divided by two and from there can calculate the distance to these objects. So it is kind of a radar, but with light uh, signals. It's been in use in uh, autonomous driving, drones, and the robotics for maps. Uh, one of the areas called SLAM, kind of uh, geographical mapping with robotics. So it's one of the very fashionable techniques, very loved by big uh, uh, automotive companies. However, uh, uh, entrepreneurs like Elon Musk, they have some precautions against a LiDAR technology because the technology itself is kind of expensive to produce. Uh, very recently, Google and Wemo uh, self-driving taxi, they have provided uh, sensors uh, with affordable prices compared to the, to the very high cost of single sensor. They've managed to uh, reduce the price to a few, uh, to, to a few uh, for example, 50 or $75 uh, per sensor which is a major improvement compared to the original price, which was in thousands. Uh, this again, uh, the model itself, the LiDAR technology was used uh, in South Korea uh, for social distancing tracking by a company specialized in producing uh, LiDAR sensors. And then they have uh, again applied the post processing filter in order to measure the distance between the objects in motion the objects in this case are persons or people, and then fire alarms when they come uh, within a circle perimeter of one meter from each other. The idea is that the sensor 
the output from the sensor is not a, an image, it's actually a point cloud. Point clouds, that means there are a lot of data points to be processed in order to come up with the 3D geometric shape. And then after you've come up with the 3D geometric shape, you need to apply segmentation. So you can see in the architecture of LiderNet, which is a, a state-of-the-art architecture put together by NVIDIA, they are using a variation of, guess what? Generative adversarial networks. The same technology that is used for deep fakes can be used for self-driving cars. And the, here, this one of the architecture that are very famous in GANs, that is the bex to bex architecture. And it is input, uh, the input in this case is the 3D point clouds and the output is the segmentation mask. With some variation, the innovation actually in this architecture is not only that it is inspired by a very simple bex to bex GAN architecture, but also it combines by a neural network combiner a projection from a bird eye view, BEV, bird eye view, and then projection from the front side view. So it's a kind of uh, having the uh, camera uh, object uh, at that uh, elevation view and then uh, converting every single point cloud into that uh, projection matrix and then combining that with the front side view to get the meaningful semantic segmentation. There are available some public data sets that you can play around with, such as NoScenes and Kitty. And you can also find uh, the source code for LiderNet. Uh, I'm not very sure because NVIDIA, they publish their source code as open source on GitHub, but it is under, under Creative Commons license, meaning you cannot use it in commercial applications. But you, at least you can get inspired. Next is the topic of diagnosis. How can we make a meaningful diagnosis? And you know the problem here, the pain point, is that the diagnosis of COVID-19 is very costly. And that's actually what started the problem in the first place, or one of the factors why the problem became that, uh, I'm very sorry. Sorry for the interruption. So one of the reasons is that the, the testing itself is not available and it's very costly and it takes some time. So given some X-ray images, can we make meaningful diagnosis in a very short time with low cost? Let's see how that done. So the idea here, uh, I will be mentioning two main papers. One is COVIDnet, which is a convolutional neural networks for COVID-19 on X-ray image, images. And the other is COVID-CT, which is a collaborative crowdsourced data set which is a kind of scrapping the data from different sources in order to come up with a public data set that has as many variations of COVID-19 uh, imagery. So that you can, uh, the enthusiasts, the hobbyists, and the uh, scientific community can come up with uh, quick results. There are many variations actually that has been published since I've done this uh, research, but they are all about the same idea, uh, collaborating the data set and then uh, applying convolution neural network or one of the other variations. I'll be mentioning the key points that uh, make these ideas very interesting to you as a hackathon competitor. The first idea here is COVID net and the innovation itself is that this network is not designed by a human. This network is designed by a machine. So using a machine to design a machine is kind of a futuristic idea. It's actually called AutoML or Neural Architecture Search. So this uh, neural network, as you can see, it's very similar to a neural network designed earlier by Microsoft called ResNet. And it has these escape connections. The pattern actually is used projection expansion, projection extension or PEPX. This kind of neural network is based on a module based on one by one convolution. One by one convolution is actually trivial convolution doing nothing. It's a kind of uh, only applied on the di filter dimension, meaning it's only applying dimension reduction in the intermediate layers uh, because the computation can get very infeasible in the hidden layers. For example, if you are working with RGB image, you have R, red, green, and blue, three channels. And then if you are working, with other intermediate layers, this number of channels can grow up to 
256, for example, or even 512. And sometimes it grows up more. You can see here in the design, it says uh, 1024. So you need to apply one by one convolution to bring the number of filters down and then apply some meaningful, uh, meaningful feature extraction and then apply one by one convolution again to expand the, that uh, filter dimension back again. So between the projection and the expansion, the network is learning the sparse features that make the uh, categories more distinct from each other. For example, if you are trying to design a classifier for apples and uh, oranges, then it will focus on the features. For example, apples are red, uh, oranges are uh, orange. So it will focus on these kind of features that discriminate these two categories. And of course, when you're talking about more uh, sophisticated examples, then the uh, features will become more meaningful. And we use tools, uh, specific visualizations tools to make sense of such interpretations. What's of great interest to you here as a competitor in this hackathon is the, uh, the, the data set COVID-X. You can go to the repository on GitHub of COVID-Net and go to the data file, data.py file, which will download all the COVID-X data set, which is a combination of, uh, again, open source data sets and a specific COVID-19 data sets that you can put together into play and uh, see if you can get better accuracy than 92.6%. The, the idea itself, again, is not very new because uh, pneumonia detection, that was an old Kaggle competition. You know, Kaggle is a data science competition framework or platform where data scientists compete on uh, research or uh, hiring or even other uh, kind of uh, data challenges. So one of the challenges that used to run in the old days is pneumonia detection. You know, pneumonia is one of the side effects of COVID-19 because it affects the respiratory system because the COVID-19 is binding with the S2 cells of the respiratory system, and then it multipl multiplies within the respiratory system, within the lungs, until the body finds that it is eating up the lungs. You can see here on the top uh, left side of the slide, the normal uh, lungs, and then the bacterial pneumonia. You know, the, the pneumonia can be used by bacteria. It can, use, be, uh, can be uh, caused by virus. It can be used by other viruses other than the COVID-19. Because COVID-19 itself, the official name or the scientific name is uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is a variation of the SARS respiratory, severe respiratory uh, system uh, disease. So the, from technical point of view, the interesting part here is that if we don't have enough data, which is the case actually in the COVID-19, because even though there are many contributions to provide data sets. The data is never enough to produce a very accurate uh, diagnosis. The, that is actually a part of the theorem, the no, uh, no free lunch theorem. This is not a, a proverb or a joke. This is a, an actual theorem in the literature of uh, data science, meaning that if you want to improve the accuracy, you need to add more data. So if you don't have that enough data, and this is a very nifty trick you can apply in this hackathon within a very few minutes, not hours, very few minutes. It's called transfer learning. You can train a neural network on ImageNet and it, it will be actually pre-trained for you. Then you can take the pre-trained network from any rep uh, repository online or from TensorFlow repository or from an, any other equivalent repository. Then use the weights as a reuse reusable module and uh, apply that for a new novel objective, such as pneumonia detection. And transfer learning is used in such applications where not enough data is sufficient to achieve the desired accuracy. So be aware of that. And also here you can see that we are having uh, multiple uh, classification objectives. We are having the normal case and we are having the bacterial, bacterial pneumonia and the viral pneumonia. And I believe in the new architectures such as COVID-Net and some other variations, you need to add whether the viral pneumonia is due to COVID-19 or other virus infection. So be aware of this distinction when you are designing your systems. One of the recommendations I would recommend here is to use DeepLab version three available in TensorFlow as a transfer learning so that you can quickly come up with very high accuracy on such systems. 
The third variation here is the COVID CT dataset, which is a variation, uh, a collaborative work uh, crowdsourcing uh, by scrapping the preprints, the images from different papers and publications on COVID-19, and then manually uh, having the annotation done to the images so that they can be used again with three different uh, classes, uh, normal, uh, viral pneumonia, or pneumonia due to COVID-19. The, the architecture is again very interesting because it's based on DenseNet. DenseNet is a variation of ResNet, and it, uh, it's the distinction between the two designs is that we have a lot of skip connections between the layer and the, the, the consequent or the next layers. So from every layer, we have a skip connection to every next layer. So unlike the other architecture, which we had the skip connections conditionally uh, between some layers and uh, skipping uh, another layer uh, between time and another. So in this case, we are having fully densed skip layer connections. The data set, again here, uh, the same idea of transfer learning. You can see how powerful transfer learning is. We've used the model DenseNet pre-trained on chest X-ray 14, which is another data set of uh, pneumonia cases with the chest X-ray images, and then added another fewer images because of course, uh, when you do scrapping, you don't, got, you don't get high quality images all the time. So they had here only 143 patients and uh, kind of two or three images per patient. So that's never enough to get higher accuracy. And you can see even after all of these efforts, it's only kind of 84.5. Let's check the messages, uh, if uh, there are any questions. Guys, do you have any questions so far? I think it's uh, okay. I, I, I heard the notification, so I, I thought somebody is uh, sending questions. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, okay, uh, let's continue. So th these are not all the ideas in this area, but that gives you an idea of what can be done quickly in order to put together a, a prototype for hackathons or for experiments with a reasonable say, level of accuracy. Now the big whale, the monster, the big topic is drug discovery. And this is kind of the, the most important thing because everything else that we've been doing is either social distancing tracking uh, or uh, diagnosis, it's all kind of measures, precautionary measures to uh, reduce the severity of the pandemic. But the solution itself is to find the drug, the vaccine, and not only to find the vaccine, but to manufacture it within a reasonable uh, time and at a, reason a reasonable cost and at scale, because we need to give that vaccine to at least 6 billion people on the planet Earth. So you can see it's kind of a challenge. And according to the statistics, uh, we have never been able to put together a vaccine in less than five years. So when uh, the scientists or the drug manufacturers say that they are pu putting together a vaccine within at least 18 months, this is kind of un unprecedented uh, case. Let's see how deep learning can help uh, in this uh, kind of challenge. Uh, a little bit about the drug discovery life cycle. So you need to do a little uh, uh, search space optimization because when you start with the, the molecular uh, space, it's kind of very dense space of probabilities. You have uh, in the order of billions or uh, uh, of chemical compounds that can be paired together to give you a new drug. So there are two variations here. The first variation is the novel drug discovery when you're trying to design a new drug from scratch. And the other, which is more uh, reasonable in this case, is the drug repurposing. And uh, a lot of research has been going into to the two areas, but I believe drug repurposing uh, makes more sense because you're not designing a new drug from scratch. You don't have to go through all the pipeline for the clinical trials of that drug, but you need to take an existing drug which uh, is known to be manufactured uh, feasibly within a reasonable cost and that it has uh, been tested in many clinical trials before on different cases and then take that drug and repurpose it 
and make it target the new virus. So in this case, drug repurposing, you need uh, to test the similarity between the virus and other uh, viral infections and test the similarity uh, uh, and test the influence of that drug on the virus proteins and then test the influence of that drug on the human organs itself. So it's kind of a very complicated uh, life cycle to come up with drugs either in the de novo or the repurposing cases. But as a deep learning engineer, you can reduce the search space. And instead of the order of billions, you can come up with as good as 30,000 uh, applicants or candidates that can go through the clinical trial, uh, uh, what we call also uh, in vivo or in uh, vita uh, clear, uh, drug discovery, meaning it's not in silico. These are kind of Latin terms in, uh, in the industry. So in silico, when you are trying to uh, design the drug on your computer simulation, um, coming from silicon, because the, the chips on the computer are silicon chips. And then in vitro or in vivo, that's when you are trying to uh, test the drug on the human uh, receptor himself. So there are kind of many interactions in this case. You are kind of drug-drug interaction, drug-protein interaction, drug uh, organ interaction. So you need to, to be aware of this kind of terminology when you're applying deep learning because each one of them will demand a different architecture and a different search keywords in the literature. Let's uh, see uh, what are some of the, uh, the designs in this area. B before we jump to the designs, uh, here is one of the resources I find very useful in that uh, uh, aspect. It's called dragbank.ca. You find a lot of uh, uh, updated day-to-day uh, -day uh, findings and discoveries on the vaccine design of the SARS COVID-19. And you can see here from the design of the virus itself, which is, even though it's a very tragic uh, virus, it's very elegant in its design. It has these spikes and these spikes, they are used to bind the virus with the respiratory system with the ACE2 cells. So these spikes are kind of the connection points. The virus uh, uses them to connect to our lung system. Uh, so one of the strategies that in the drug design is to find a drug uh, or a uh, DNA or RNA mutation that will uh, cut or uh, corrupt or uh, eliminate these spikes so that the virus is harmless. It cannot bind with any receptor anymore. That's one of the ideas. The other idea, uh, you can see the bank envelope, the bank protein envelope. You can design a protein, a drug uh, protein interaction network that can target the bank envelope so that it can break it. And once it's broken, then the virus cannot last uh, very long in the uh, uh, open atmosphere. And actually one of the strengths point of this virus is that it can live for many hours and even up to days on surfaces without any nutrition or any life support from the host system, which is kind of why it, it, it propagates so fast. Once you go to uh, on the subway or any place that somebody else with the infection have conducted the virus to any surface, metal or plastic, then you will you will pick up the virus and it can stay for as, as far as one of the papers I've read in that aspect, 37 days, which is kind of an extreme. So between few hours to 37 days, that's a very powerful combination. And that, that brings up the discussion whether this is a natural mutation or designed in a laboratory, but let's leave this discussion for another day. So the third strategy, is to target the RNA strands inside the protein envelope. That's actually the living organ because inside the bank envelope is one strand because this virus is one stranded virus of, uh, of 29,000 gene uh, uh, molecules or gene uh, uh, signatures. So it's, it's kind of not very long compared to the bacteria. The bacteria is uh, in, in the order of millions of gene signatures, but this virus is in the order of 29,000 
which is kind compared to other viruses, it's a uh, developed a lot of development because it's a uh, kind of uh, long, but compared to bacteria, for example, it's not that long, but you can apply some of RNA strategy mutation on the internals of the virus itself. So you can see here, there, is, there are three kinds of interactions, but it's basically a drug protein interaction. So this drug protein interaction can be predicted with a neural network because at the end of the day, it's a classification problem. Either the interaction is going to happen in a positive way and the drug is going to destroy the virus, or either that the interaction is going to happen in a negative way and the drug is going to improve the virus. So this is one of the things you should be aware when you are working on your network, don't improve the virus. We had enough from this virus so far. We don't want, we don't need any mutations. But the other third classification output is when you're having a neutral, a neutral case when the, there is no interaction, zero interaction between the drug and the protein itself. So let's see one of the networks. You can see here this network is molecular GAN, MOLGAN. One of the very sophisticated, very elegant designs in the area of deep learning. I, I spend a lot, of time, a lot of time looking at this architecture. And why I love it is it because it's a hybrid, a hybrid of three ideas. The first idea is generative adversarial networks, which we have reviewed in passing at the beginning of this uh, uh, presentation. And the second is deep reinforcement learning. And the third is graph convolution networks. So it's kind of Halloween and Christmas coming on one day. So all of the patterns, all of the modules in deep learning in one design. But let's break it down a little. What purpose are they serving? The graph convolution networks, again, they are extracting the features from the 3D molecular designs. So that makes sense. We have already covered that. The generative adversarial networks is uh, is proposing candidate molecular uh, architect uh, designs for the new drug discovery. Uh, for example, uh, uh, three carbons with uh, two oxygen with, with other uh, sulfates and so on. And then the discriminator of the generative adversarial network will decide, is this actually a chemical compound or is this just a gibberish uh, compound that cannot be manufactured at all? So these kinds of interactions, they are available in a data set called the QM9 or quantum machines or quantum mechanics nine data set. It has pairs of molecules, uh, organic molecules that can be used in or, uh, drug discovery. And then it has a lot of chemical properties can be paired together. What is the energy required to pair them together? What is the uh, temperature of the reaction uh, uh, is this reaction feasible within uh, two uh, chemical reactions in a chemical reaction pathway? Many other properties that can be, uh, from a chemical point of view, be uh, desirable uh, in for the manufacturing uh, process. So that's for the generative adversarial network part, whether it is valid or invalid, real or fake, kind of the police detective thing that we have talked about. But what, what about the reward network? What, what is deep reinforcement learning doing here? Remember when we said policy gradients, they work on continuous action space. So for example, when I'm producing a new drug, I want it to be able to uh, tra distribute it through the blood veins to the organs we are trying to work on for in this case of COVID-19, the respiratory system. So when we design the, re the reward network, we want solubility, for example, between zero and one or between zero and 100%. So we want 0.7 solubility. We, want, we don't want 100%, we want 0.7 or 0.9. So this is kind of the reward function. We design a reward function that captures these kind of chemical properties, the distribution, the exertion, the metabolism, the solubility, many other chemical properties, give them weights, give them scores, and then combine that in a weighted average, calculate the reward, apply back propagation so that the generator can learn to produce the output with the desired probabilities. So it says uh, in the experimental results of this Molgan paper uh, that the valid compounds is 100%, but then a new paper uh, came up very recently, uh, about two weeks ago, that, uh, ha that has uh, argued against this 
validity assumption because even if the, comp the component is valid, we don't want a component that can be manufactured uh, over 100 chemical reactions. We want as few chemical reactions as possible. So it's, it's always, uh, as with every research, there are pros and cons. Again, transfer learning plays an important role in this case. You can take a model trained on natural language processing, transfer learning to the model, pre, uh, re, uh, reuse it as a modular component for chemical uh, compound design. But in this case, you are using uh, a new language because it's not the natural language, it's called the SMILES language, which has syntax and semantics, syntax and grammar. And this language is kind of the, uh, the, the de facto language for chemical compound design. So if you are not working with graph convolution, you can use a SMILE language and you can use actually a, a pre-processing step to convert the SMILES language to a graph representation, which is possible because at the end of the day, the SMILES is a language representing 3D moleculars and then apply graph convolutions on the output. So whatever variation you're trying to play around with, transfer learning again is proving very useful, very fast to produce uh, efficient prototypes. Here comes the, the deep drug repurposing architecture, a very recent paper, very recently published, and it has a lot of technical details, but uh, in a nutshell, it's kind of trying to, at the first stage, stage A, at the top of the right side graph, it's trying to build up matrices. These matrices, they represent the similarity between different drugs, between different proteins, and trying to find a kind of, uh, this drug works on that protein, and then put that in uh, features that then can be used in stage B with autoencoder. So we have talked about autoencoders multiple times so far when we talked about transformers, we said that they are representation learning because we are allowing a neural network to find a bottleneck representation, which is very representative of the discriminative features of the inputs. For, for, and then this representation can be used in arithmetics. For example, if we say the word man compared to the word woman, and then we say the word king compared to the word queen. So we can find the analogy, the king, queen, man, woman, kind of a analogy playing in here. But can we do arithmetics? Can we say king minus man plus woman? What, what is the output? And then the network, which is trained in this fashion, the output will be queen. So we are learning a new projection space in which we are projecting the features and then we are trying to take the features in that projection space and apply arithmetics in a useful meaning uh, that can be used for different uh, conditioning on the applications. So in the, in the area of, uh, of uh, images, when you are applying generative adversarial networks, for example, if you take the representation of a human face, and then if you find out the representation of eyeglasses, and then you say human plus eyeglasses, and then fit that through the network, the output will be the same face, but wearing eyeglasses. And then if you play with the background, if you say, for example, a, a, a bird, and then the vector for background in the forest, and then a bird in the forest, you can apply this arithmetics and you get a bird in the forest. Similarly, you can apply similar logic using this kind of autoencoders so that you can get, for example, conditioning. We want a drug that works on the respiratory system for the COVID-19 variation of, uh, of the SARS-CoV-1 or MERS, Middle East Respiratory System uh, Syndrome. So at the last level of the network, you are actually predicting the score of the interaction between the drug, the protein, and the, uh, the drug, the protein, and the organ of the human body in a combination uh, finding whether this drug works for this uh, virus at this uh, organ or system of the human biology. Again, very intuitive ideas. The complexity, of course, is respected because things like this take uh, some time. But you know the trick now. Whenever in, uh, in shortage of time, apply transfer learning. The results can be validated by clinicaltrials.gov, which is a national 
website by the United States government uh, and uh, approved by the FDI. It's, it's actually part of the process of getting the approval by the FDI for new drugs. And this network, which is very recent, has managed to find new drugs for Alzheimer and other uh, uh, dementia-related diseases. Uh, these drugs, they were used for other things. So it's drug repurposing, DR. And also some, some other disease which are mentioned in the appendices of this paper. So these are kind of ideas that uh, can inspire you on your journey during the hackathon and even after the hackathon in that respect. We have fallen short of time to cover everything, but I will give you some reference to some other uh, ideas that you can pursue uh, for inspiration. So data visualization itself is one of the things that can aid in the decision making process because not everybody is technical, not everybody is going to dive that deep in deep learning, but decision makers, they need visualization tools that uh, give them kind of data mining reports on the available research, for example, uh, can chloroquine be used on COVID-19? So this is actually the, the allegation made by Donald Trump in the United States, saying that the chloroquine can be used on the COVID-19, but uh, you can see from this graph, it makes sense because the chloroquine works with COVID-1 and with uh, Ebola, with SARS, with other, many other influenza and uh, respiratory system uh, diseases. But then from another point of view in clinical trials, it didn't work out. So don't always uh, make assumptions and verify them with data. Take the output from your visualization and data mining processes with a grain of salt. You can prove anything. For example, you can say, uh, this is are my findings before I look at the sun. And this is the, the output after I looked at the sun. And here you find some correlation, but we always say correlation in statistics is not causality. For example, if you uh, notice that uh, the temperature has risen and then the stock market has made uh, a lot of profit, there may be some correlation. They may be, uh, that's one of the factors why the up uptick in the price, but causality is not assured. So get, take that with a grain of salt. One of the ideas is the blood tests. We have not covered that in detail, but again, it's a similar line of thoughts. You apply, you, have, you get the data, crowdsource it, public data sets, get a GitHub repository, a transfer learning model, apply some statistics, visualize your results, uh, prototype things quickly. The, the third idea I'd like to uh, dig on is the question answering. For example, uh, in Google, if you type in search uh, some question related to COVID-19, it will come up with some nicely arranged results. So you can play around with question answering using a Quora data set because it's actually a very good data set on questions and answers. And the last thing here is time series forecasting, which we have kind of covered when we talked about the epidemiology, but time series itself is a field on its own that requires some attentions and some techniques, unique techniques peculiar to that area. That concludes this overview, a high level overview of deep learning and how it can be used in fighting the pandemic and how it can be used for quick prototypes for hackathons like the one we are in now. I'll be glad to receive your questions, if any. Thank you so much, Mustafa. Uh, this was an amazing session. Uh, really, really, really beneficial. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, please uh, post them in the Q&A. Questions or comments? Mm. Maybe they're still uh, digesting the content. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, as you said, it, it, may, it will be available as a recording for if somebody yes. wants to review the material once again. Uh, Yes. How many CT scans do you think we need to have a robust model for COVID-19 detection? So this is a question by Tarek Zidazi. So this question is very good. Uh, it can be answered subjectively and objectively. So subjectively speaking, you need in the order of thousands of images to apply a, a efficient, a reliable uh, COVID-19 detection on imagery. But objectively, 
speaking, uh, objectively speaking, I can see here a, a notification saying that Sabrine, you would like to answer the question live. Uh, I'm not no, sure. No, no, you, you are uh, answering it already. Yeah. Are answering it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm just saying that we are answering the question now live. Oh, okay, yeah. good, good. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. So, objectively speaking, you need to graph the number of images you have versus the accuracy you are getting. For example, I started my model with 10 images and I got accuracy of 30%. And then I graphed my model with 50 images and I got 35. And then you find this linear relation or exponential relation between the number of images you're having and the accuracy you are getting. And then you do extrapolation. Extrapolation meaning you say, okay, now I managed to get 1,000 images and that put me to the level of 85% accuracy. So, assumably, if I follow the same line of thoughts, if I need 99% of accuracy, I would need, for example, uh, 10,000 images. So, the answer to your question, subjectively, some thousand images. Objectively, you need to graph that and uh, uh, infer the actual number from the experimental results of your work. But then, why bother? You can always use transfer learning because I have shown you there are many pneumonia detection pre-trained models that you can reuse in your system and they are public, available, open source without any licensing. I hope that I have ever covered your question, Tarek. Perfect. Osama is telling you that he found the webinar very useful. <laughs> so thank you for the presenter. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, Osama. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I think Osama is asking, what is the best business model fit those kind of technical work to introduce any idea to the market? Uh, I'm not the very uh, uh, business guy who can answer this question efficiently. I will add just a piece of information and then I'll allow Sabrine to add more on the business uh, model uh, aspect. I, I know <laughs> she will uh, contribute more to this question, but most of the applications I have demonstrated, they are coming from the background of companies working, for example, in uh, uh, LiDAR sensors production, and then they have made an uh, side application or project in contribution with the government on a license-based model or a very reduced fee model so that the government can use that in fighting the pandemic. And subsequently, when this, the problem is solved, our businesses will come back to life. But uh, I hope that Supreme can add to the business model thing, as I'm not an expert on business in this aspect. Uh, <laughs> so you're 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 giving me the ball in my my field. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I'm not really the expert when it comes to deep learning, but I'm thinking, as Mustafa said, that we that you should be thinking about a subscription-based model. Uh, so um, so basically. Uh, when it comes to the pandemic situation, I'm, I'm not really uh, sure. Uh, I don't know, like Mustafa, is there a business beyond the pandemic? I would say that we are in a situation that would last for at least a couple of years. Mustafa said that it takes five years to actually produce the drug or the, uh, so, uh, I think you can have still a sustainable business model and you can figure out after the situation is over preventive uh, methods or preventive uh, solutions uh, uh, for future pandemics. So you can take it on a wider scale. Uh, so first start with thinking about the subscription-based model, uh, what fits uh, in your uh, situation and then in the future, upon receiving more market feedback, you would be able to actually uh, uh, figure out a sustainable uh, model that would uh, uh, continue in the future. Uh, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope this was... Uh, Osema, maybe you tell us more about, uh, uh, about the technical work that you are actually doing. Maybe we can give you some customized uh, tailored answer uh, to your project. 
So, Osema, we're waiting for this. Muhammad is saying, thank you for all the information. I'm asking, can I read with uh, L-I-D-A-R, deep learning and autonomous driving? Uh, thank you, Sapreen, for answering the business model question. That was a good answer. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Muhammad, thank you for the question. This is an interesting one. Uh, very simply, LiDAR technology or light radar uh, is one of the very uh, prominent technologies in autonomous driving, drones, and I've said uh, uh, mapping applications. So you need, you, you need to uh, uh, search for the keyword uh, point cloud processing, point cloud, because this is actually the output from the sensor readings. And then you need to apply segmentation to these point clouds. So you will find some classic techniques using uh, uh, machine learning, uh, uh, for example, applying a, a, a histogram of gradients and then applying a classifier uh, or a segmentation. And then some others, it will be end-to-end -end application like the one we have reviewed in this slide is the uh, LiDAR net. There are many variations in between. So uh, start your search with point clouds. And for autonomous driving itself, there is Carla. Carla is a, a platform simulation environment in OpenGL, open source by mm -hmm. Intel that you can use to uh, prototype and experiment with the autonomous driving applications you are building. Thank you, Mohammed, for the question. Thank you, Mustafa. So Osama is back saying it's kind of machine learning model to predict some features in case we face another pandemic. So you have it in your answer, actually, you have it in your question. If it's uh, something related to another, if it's something related to predicting other pandemics, uh, you can always think of, uh, of uh, business models that are uh, in collaboration with the authorities, with governments, with the uh, health uh, institutions, uh, I would say that uh, a business model that uh, would, uh, that, I mean, something that is based on predictive uh, uh, analysis is, is, is very, is not an easy sell, but uh, it's a straightforward sell. So uh, you can, I don't know, like Mustafa, what do you think? I think it's... Uh, well, uh, thank you, Safreen, again. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, two, two arguments are in, uh, can be brought to the table in here. So the first one is Bill Gates. He says that this pandemic is not the last one. It's actually just the beginning. And then the other is a report by the Chinese, uh, the Chinese government saying that they are expecting a mutation of COVID-19 very soon. So uh, whatever business model you come with, it, it will not be thrown out in, in, the, in, the, in the wind but uh, it would be used for sure for future pandemics as pandemics now are becoming more of a lifestyle uh, and the businesses have to cope with it. So besides that, I think more when you are building your business model, it's not consumer facing anymore because I wouldn't expect you to sell me predictions on the uh, next pandemic wave, but I would expect you actually to sell your in insights to governments and enterprise so that they can make uh, uh, useful decisions. So it, it, as, as Sabrina said, subscription based, but enterprise facing most of the time, or at least that's what I think. Yes, I agree. I totally agree. Thank you, Osama. Uh, thank you so much, Osama. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. Oh, thank you, Sabrina. That was mm -hmm. a very good opportunity. And uh, thanks for organizing the hackathon. Mm -hmm. I hope it brings some good ideas that can help all of the Arab world and actually all of the globe, uh, are around, people around the globe to fight the pandemic in meaningful ways. Thanks to you for that. And thanks to you for the opportunity to bring me to speak in here with this uh, very gentle audience. Uh, if there are any more questions, we can conclude this session, right? Yes, yes, definitely. We can conclude the session, guys. Thank you so much for your attendance and for your attention. Thank you, Mustafa, for the amazing session. It was very insightful, even for someone who's non-technical like me. But uh, I guess I learned a lot uh, today. Thank you so much. And, uh, and yeah, till next time then. Thank well, you. My, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, see you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.